So today we're going to move into McCormick's constructive material. Um, we're going to do this, do this in three parts. So this will be part one of three. And we're going to begin by talking about what he thinks can be retained from Chalcedon and repaired and um, adapted for his concerns. Um, but before that, we need to grasp what makes a Christology reformed for him. Emphasizing a particular dimension of um, Chalcedon, reformed Christology sought to preserve the two natures of Christ subsequent to their union. So this would help ward off the Lutheran tendencies to suggest that the divine nature interpenetrates the human nature in Christ. For reform thinkers, this could only lead to a sort of divinization that would essentially obliterate the human nature. Instead of this, the extraordinary gifts bestowed upon Jesus by the Holy Spirit are created gifts, not uncreated through participation in the triune life. So the emphasis in Reformed Christology is on the unimpaired integrity of the two natures involved. Now, even though early Reformed thinkers didn't really do much with pneumatological Christologies or, or spirit Christologies, they opened the door for them by suggesting that the elevation of Christ's humanity took place through created gifts that were bestowed by the Spirit. The only act performed by the Logos in relation to the human nature was the act of assuming it. So to quote McCormack, all subsequent acts performed by the God-human were performed humanly, which is to say, in the power of the Holy Spirit, end quote. So these tendencies, resisting the instrumentalization of the human nature by the Logos, and affirming the idea that Jesus acts in the power of the Spirit, i.e. humanly, are, quote, non-negotiable in any Christology that even today would lay claim to the name Reformed, end quote. Now, the question that arises here is, what about the old school genus Tapionaticum, or the genus of humility, something like that? Um, Cormac sets it aside, but for a very specific reason. Quote him, when the old Reformed rejected the genus Tapionaticum, what they were really rejecting was an interpretation of nature slash substances that would create space for the much despised genus Magistaticum, or the divine nature sharing its attributes with the human nature, so, end quote. But they, like their opponents, were captured still by substance metaphysics. So their only option was to cut the ground from under the genus Magistaticum by insisting that there is no communication between the natures, but only from the natures to the whole Christ. But the Reformed were only able to treat a communication of human predicates to the person as figurative, not concrete, real specifically, leading to problems to do with the unity of the person. So McCormick doesn't reject the genus Tapionaticum in the way that the older Reformers did. Instead, like Bart, McCormick translates the two natures into understanding the divine and human as arising out of, to quote Bart, the history of God in his mode of existence as the sun history of God in his mode of existence as the sun, what divine means and what human means are determined by this history, which constitutes the essence of both. So instead of two substantial natures in one person, McCormack posits, quote, the existence of a single composite hypostasis constituted in time by means of what I call the ontological receptivity of the eternal son to the act of being proper to the human Jesus as human. The eternal logos being ontologically receptive means that there is an eternal act of identification on the part of the logos with the human Jesus that determines Jesus's identity as the second person of the Trinity, even before the actual uniting occurs. The son is eternally determined for incarnation and unites through receptivity. But McCormick can't really say more than this at this point until he reconstructs what can be retained from Chalcedon, which he will do. And that will be in the next video. This move, however, does the work that the genus Tapionaticum would have done, but without accepting classical metaphysics, all the while retaining the integrity of the divine and human natures in their uniting, which is essential for a reformed Christology. So now we're going to move into McCormack's repairing of Chalcedon, what can be retained, really, and also what needs to be dispensed with. As far as dispensing with is the idea that the person of the union is the pre-existent Logos as such. Why was this a mistake? First, scripture doesn't appear to have an independent Logos, a Sarkos, but rather sees it as a composite entity, this Logos, a Sarkos. Composite entity in anticipation of the incarnation in time. 
And the name of this composite entity in scripture is Jesus Christ. As eternally generated, the son already has a relation to Jesus of Nazareth, a relation characterized by receptivity. Two, identifying the person of the union with the preexistent logos as such led to the doctrine of Anne and, and hypostasia, which prevented any real relation of Christ's humanity to the person of the unity, Christ's humanity to the person of the union. Three, diethylitism, doctrine of two wills, this was a sound instinct, according to McCormick initially, but it became taken for granted once Gregory of Nyssa argued for a human mind, will, and energy of operation in Jesus. To quote McCormack, it is pointless to affirm a human mind and will in Jesus if they do not function with the degree of spontaneity that is present in all human acts, end quote. Jesus was never passive, but self-active, meaning he is a human subject. So for McCormack, this is going to mean that we're going to need to think carefully about the choice between a single subject Christology and a two subjects Christology, especially given the ways that the discussion has been framed previously. Now, what about the two natures? Um, the meaning of nature, natures, is quite contested, but that's not so much the problem for McCormack. The real issue is that it has been conceived substantially. The right move is McCormick has already indicated, is to go with Bart and see the divine and human natures or the, the divinity and humanity as a single, as part of a single shared history of God okay, and determined by that history. Now, what about the language of hypostasis? Um, this is really a term that says that something exists or that something has been re made real. For something to be hypostasized means that it has been made concretely real, okay? With respect to Christology, it allows us to say that there is but one concrete entity, not a divine entity indwelling the human one. And since thatness is not a defining term, there's no reason why we can't understand what has been made concrete and realized as a composite entity. So the hypostatic union remains important for McCormack to identify a singular entity that, that is compositely divine and human. To quote him, it can accommodate the suggestion that the son has an eternal relation to Jesus that has now been actualized, rendered concrete, really re concretely real through uniting in time, end quote. Now, a few other things to retain. Chalcedon bears witness to, quote, one and the same son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity. So this means that McCormack's account of kenosis needs to entail no divestment of any of the divine attributes, which we'll see in the next video. Um, another dimension of Chalcedon, quote, the same truly God and truly man of a rational soul and a body. To continue on, so McCormack likes that, of course. Um, to continue on, a little bit more tricky. Um, consubstantial with the Father as regards to his divinity and the same consubstantial uh, with us as regards his humanity, end quote. While McCormick is suspicious of certain uses of the homoousion, um, what's being said here does indicate something important to hang on to, that Christ is one with the Father and one with us. But McCormack will want to find a way to preserve this without using concepts of divine and human substance in the way that they've been classically understood. Uh, quote, like us in all respects except for sin. So here's where I have some questions. McCormack says, quote, it is my view that every individual's sin nature is the consequence of their acts of sin, not their presupposition. And since Christ committed no acts of sin, he had no sin nature either, end quote. I would want to know if conceiving of sin in more of a Pauline sense as part of the Adamic reality, um, enslaving power that has captured humanity in the cosmos, um, into which Christ incarnates, uh, can preserve this as well. Um, while also suggesting that the incarnate Christ assumes this sinful condition without sinning in order to bear it, lower it, and terminate it on the cross. I'm not so sure I'm with McCormack on the idea that acts of sin result in a sin nature. I think my conception of sin would have more to do with a power that enslaves and harms and damages from without. Um, McCormack's accounts would seem to tie sin a bit too closely to individual human acts or choices that I'm comfortable with. But that would just be something I, I would want to know more about. 
Um, another dimension of Chalcedon, quote, begotten from before all ages from the Father as regards to his divinity, and in the last day is the same for us and for our salvation from Mary, the Virgin Theotokos. This is key. Mary gave birth not just to any human, but to the God human. So it makes absolute sense to call her Theotokos. As for eternal begetting, yes, but insofar as it is teleologically ordered to incarnation and time, thereby affirming the proper relation between the Son and Jesus in eternity by way of anticipation. Now finally, quote, um, the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person and single subsistent being, end quote. This can be affirmed as long as we push back on the substantial account of nature and natures and suggest that the single subsistent being is composite, and as Bart would say, determined by the concrete history of the divine and human. Okay. Now, McCormack moves to unpack his account of Reformed canonicism in the light of what can be pulled through and repaired from Chalcedon, which is what we're going to talk about in the next video. So thank you all for watching this. Please um, like and subscribe, leave a comment. Um, I'm thankful for all of you who have been watching this series. It means a lot to me. I really care about this, this book. It's been a joy to read through, and I hope it's been helpful for those of you who are reading through the book at the moment, or will be helpful in the future um, if you do get the book. Um, I hope this can be a good sort of companion um, to that. So with that, this has been Apocalypse Here, Christianity You Can Live With.